from South Africa to Morocco, Sierra Leone to Nigeria. The ancient art of storytelling has for eons helped us make sense of our world and our own emotion. Stories provide us with the platform to transmit our ideas and the knowledge of old. A vehicle to comprehend the past and better plan for the future. We use uh, storytelling as one of uh, those tools that, that, that were used in, 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 in the olden times. You know, people in heritage institutions, they, they, they will say to you, this is the tool. You know, olden, uh, people in the olden days use their, the, the, their memory to record the past so that we're able to understand the present and root the future. From stories about the infamous Shaka Zulu, to the indigenous knowledge systems of the Khoi, to the great diplomatic prowess of King Mushuesh, by hearing these stories, we find an alternative way of understanding the events that shape our present. We have to understand where we come from in order to move forward. And in South Africa, our history is so rich, it's diverse. You can see in our culture today, in South Africa, we have so many different cultures. The stories of those who led the struggle against apartheid features as a major point in South Africa's story. However, ordinary people have not been afforded the opportunity to make sense of the experiences of apartheid and the attainment of freedom in 1994. By telling their own stories, South Africans are given the opportunity not only to heal from psychological trauma, but also to chart a new road towards a nation united in diversity. History is very important uh, if we are going to have a, a, a socially cohesive society, a society that has a sense that values the struggles that this country has gone through, a, a, a society that values the importance of uh, human rights because of the human rights abuses that happened in the past. Many people have stories that can be told, that can be produced, that people, many people around the country do not know. Stories that literally helped um, bring this country to freedom. You know, there are many heroes which are unrecognized. I was born in 1933 in Cape Town. My parents were immigrants from England. They were communists. They would not accept the racism of South Africa. And so I grew up in a home where people of all races and all social classes came to visit. Working people at the end of the day in their heavy boots and their dirty clothes, but also professors and doctors and lawyers. And so I learned to respect people. And if I didn't, my mother would get very angry. And so it becomes second nature for me to see people as people. And from a very young age, I wanted to be an engineer to build roads and dams and bridges and houses for people. And then I discovered when I went to University of Cape Town that I could build for white people, not for people. And then there was a massacre at Sharpville and also in Cape Town the same day in 1960. And our people began to say, we can't go on like this. We have to be able to hit back. We have to be able to protect our people from the violence of the police, the police dogs, the imprisonments. And so Nelson Mandela and others, including Joe Slovo of the Communist Party and others in the ANC and the other Congresses, talked of creating an armed force to resist against the apartheid oppression. They call it a grand apartheid. It was designed to actually dehumanize us, to ensure that we remain the servants of the white people. The segregation philosophy of apartheid left an indelible mark. Certain restaurants, beaches, public places were reserved for whites only. And it's only by expressing these memories that healing can take place. But I remember something that happened when I was just about four years old and, and I was going uh, to the beach with my father and I, I could smell the nice uh, wimpy food, uh, you know, and, and I wanted to 
have a sandwich there. And we were walking past and, and I was like, Daddy, I want the sandwich. And he says, no, you know, you, we can't go there. And, and as, a, as, as a little child, I, I just, I couldn't comprehend it because at the end of the day, I saw myself like everybody else. And he had to explain to me, you know, at that young age. And it had such a negative impact because you realize that you treat it so unequally that you can't even go in and buy a sandwich from, from a restaurant because of the color of your skin. Many who labored under unjust laws and undue hardships were afforded the opportunity to be heard. One of the things that I need to always start with is that I was born and brought up by a single parent, and that's my mom. Now, being brought up by a single mom, parent comes with its own challenges. I knew that the, the poverty of my mother was real. Um, and, and, and the story that I always want to mention about the poverty at my house uh, is, 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 is one incident where my mom collapsed in the house um, and we had to get neighbors to come in. We were only told late in our lives when we were already adults that my mom had collapsed because she hadn't eaten for three days because we were a priority. She didn't have enough but she would buy a bag of milly meal, but she would want to make sure that it sustains her for a better part of that month. Because if the, that milly meal gets finished before, she wouldn't have another. And we were later told that her sugar levels were down. That's why she actually collapsed. In remembering our past, we are able to see the true value of freedom. This is so because our stories contain the truth about who we are and enables us to assimilate the multitude of experiences that shape our very existence. I wasn't politically conscious until a very late age, uh, I think until matric. So I really was oblivious to, to what apartheid was and what was going on in the rest of the country. In, in many senses, I would describe myself um, as being, as having really been a, a conservative racist. When I think back, I had particular, very prejudicial views of particularly African people. Uh, not that I had interacted with them. We, our schools were Indian, the sports clubs were Indian, the entire environment, uh, basically African people were just workers in, in, in that particular area. Um, and it took two teachers in particular both English teachers in standard nine and ten, to really challenge my, I, I would I would say very conservative and reactionary views about people who were African. I suppose because in in the in the where, wherever I had waited, we, I was serving mainly white people and saw them in a very superior role, um, and African people as being inferior in a sense. Uh, these English teachers challenged my views over a period of two years and got me to rethink my identity in the most profound manner. Many ordinary people motivated by a dream of a non-racial society rebelled against the system. By hearing their stories, we add yet another dimension to our understanding of South Africa's past and future. I was born in, in the Val Triangle a small township called uh, Mayerton in the 50s during the time of the forced removal. In 1966 then we were forcefully removed. My family was forcefully removed to what was known as Sebukeng Township. So under the mass democratic movement, uh, under the leadership of the UDF, is where now I started to understand real politics about why certain things happened to me and my family. And the, the whole vision of a non-racial democratic South Africa started to make sense to me that we really had to, to, to work as a collective to change this country, not necessarily what the regime was doing at that time, giving us you know, as freedoms in peace meals, you know, to say here is a 
blue green book now you can go and build a house in this area so we really wanted to see real change coming into our lives and that's what actually made me to fiercely become part of the mass democratic movement the Sharpeville and Langa massacres, the Soweto and Baal uprisings claimed the lives of many rallying against unjust laws. The youth of yesteryear were willing to sacrifice their lives for change. By hearing their stories, we learn about what it really meant to outsmart and outclass the system of the day. 1976, I, I know when, I'm, when I say 1976, it, it, it brings many memories, so many of us. You know, it was a spring that very few South Africans escaped. Now, here we are, as young as 15, 1976, we knew about the existence of these organizations that were born, that, 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 that were banned in South Africa. You could not talk about those organizations openly, including their members let alone their leadership. You see, it means at some point in time, you could not even talk about your brother who was arrested because he was associated with this organization. You can imagine how was the situation like. It, it taught a number of us how to be grounded, how to be disciplined, how to elude, how to outclass, how to outsmart the system. I left the country, but with my mom's blessings. Um, but she didn't know that when I leave the country, I was going to take an option. Uh, because I remember that when you get into exile, you would be asked, do you want to go to school or you want to, to go into the army? And for me, I just felt, you know what? Education can wait. Not because I was not passionate about my education, but I just felt this is the easy way of going back in my young age to go and struggle and fight and bring about the change in the South African situation. I didn't like leaving my mother and in my small mind I felt that I will then train quickly and come back and fight. I only realized after we had crossed into Swaziland to say, God, what have I done? We could have been arrested, something could have happened, we could have been shot. But I think at that time, I think pro probably it assisted being young. Uh, you know, sometimes when you are young, the, the dangers are not as massive as if I were to think now as an adult, you think a lot of things. But at the time, what was in my head is that I needed to bring about change. And, and, and that passion, sadly, I still have it even to this day. And, and that's why I've ended up in the public service. When we went to the camps, there was no separation that women have a different training and men were having a different one. That's where we got to know that we are here fighting the same war, same enemy, whether it's men or women, and it came with its own challenges. Uh, but I wouldn't say it is challenges that I would say I regret. It came with challenges that I knew when it is time for running. There's no question of saying women shouldn't run. We, we were running the same. When it came to assigning tasks, there was never a question of saying women should be given a separate task as opposed to. But equally, one should say that even the men, a lot of mil um, ANC male have had to go through a transition that we also as, as women. And I, the one specific incident, I think I, I remember we had a lot of men who were so fixated that the cooking is meant to be done by women. And they had to go through that whole transition that, you know what, there is a roster, uh, whether I like it or not, uh, I have to cook, it's my turn. And if it is a, my turn as a woman to cook, we would cook. We've never been without food, uh, quite frankly, uh, because the male comrades were always there, out there to go and, and, and get an animal because we couldn't get fresh meat but they will always be out there getting us some meat and we would always have meat. In my period in the camp, I've eaten a snake, I've eaten a porcupine, and all of those were things that I would never, under normal circumstances, go and, and, and just go to the butchery and go and buy. The apartheid government enforced their law with their full might. Protests against the system were quelled by police. State-sponsored violence was a part of life. 
I remember in 1985, we actually boycotted classes as students because we said we wanted uh, Bantu education to be removed in its entirety. It needed to be scrapped. And then, as you can imagine, not one, not a single institution could bring that about. But then the investor of the North student body said we are not going back to classes until Bantu education is scrapped in its entirety. And students from other universities, they thought that maybe we were crazy, you know. How could we collapse Bantu education being a single unit? But that is, that is what we did. And then uh, the state of emergency was, was declared. When I woke up in the morning, my, my room was surrounded by, by, by members of the armed forces, the South African Defense Force, and then we were beaten. Every time we went on strike, we would say, direction, then everybody would say Mangueng. Mangueng is the police station where we were handing over memoranda. And every time we protested against the system of apartheid, we would go to the police station, either to bend the flag or to try and stone the uh, police vehicles. And then they would come back to the university running because the police would come after us. So we have been affected in, a, in, a big, uh, in big time by, by, by apartheid at that time, you know. The sacrifices of young people paved the way to the first democratic elections in 1994. After two decades of democracy, South Africa has grown substantially. The fact that we have 11 official languages that are recognized uh, by the country is also an important factor for me. You know, um, that, that language which is su such a close identity marker in your life that it's actually recognized as an important facet for development. So for me, those are very important issues. You look at how the lives, particularly the lives of rural people, have been affected by this transformation. Um, you know, there's been a, ro a rollout of um, electricity um, and, 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 and water services to rural communities, things that rural people struggled with uh, in the past. I believe we, 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 we've sacrificed quite a lot of our lives as young people. But for me, when I look back, uh, I feel that we have made a contribution. Uh, South Africa wouldn't have been where it is now if we were not resolute in changing the system that was in existence at the time. If we use all the institutions that we have created for the good of the country, South Africa is destined for, for bigger things. So diversity in terms of sexual orientation, in terms of disability, etc., should be celebrated and understood and appreciated, not tolerated. I'd like for South Africa to be a more just society, a society that is compassionate, a society that cares um, a society that really knows its past. Right? For the unsung heroes, and I really mean those people that were not um, congratulated and given rewards for what they did, to be, to be given that, that reward and to be highlighted and, to, and for people to actually know them, because this is information that could help us as the youth and it could we could learn so much more from just the, the stories that they tell us. One can only hope that as a country, as a people and as a community, we can invest more time and more energy towards ensuring that we uplift the educational levels of our people because there's nothing that beats education. Mm -hmm. And I think we upskill them in the right way so that we become competitive in the global arena. A wise South African once said, that the counterpoint against amnesia of the past is truth-telling of the story. Mm -hmm.